A lot of people think that all the notions of sexual liberation and just doing whatever you want with your body are some kind of experience that came out of the 60s. And yet all the sexual liberation gurus of today were profoundly influenced by the radical sex movements of the early part of the century. The one person who would perhaps leave the most enduring imprint on sex in the 20th century was neither scientist nor martyr, but a diminutive nurse from the mining towns of upstate New York, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a very interesting, passionate, and, and complex woman. She was the daughter of a very devout Catholic mother and a free-thinking father who was always trying to go against the grain. She was an extraordinarily captivating person, kind of an Irish beauty, very wholesome in the Yeatsian poetic sense of wholesome beauty. Margaret's wholesome demeanor disguised a pagan spirit that often ruled her heart. In 1910, already married to architect William Sanger and a mother of three, she relocated her family to New York City's radical hotbed, Greenwich Village. Here, art mixed with politics, Marxism promised to change the world, and boys dared to be girls. In this heady environment of anything goes, Margaret Sanger drank in the sermons of fiery anarchist Emma Goldman, who preached social revolution and free love. Can there be anything more outrageous than the idea that a healthy, grown woman must abstain from the depth and glory of sex experience until a good man comes along to take her unto himself as a wife? Women in the free love philosophy said, I'm not going to be defined by marriage. I'm not going to be owned by a man. If they had marriages, they were marriages of convenience. They had other lovers. Sometimes they were bisexual. They believed the world could be changed and that humanity could be bettered by thinking about a transformation in social and sexual relations. Sanger took the free love philosophy to heart and dallied with a few lovers of her own. But she realized that women would never be truly free to live and love as they chose until they were also free from the threat of an unwanted pregnancy. Many people are horrified at the idea of birth control. While to me, it is simply the keynote of a new moral program. While many European countries had promoted the distribution of contraceptives since the mid-1800s, in America, simply offering information on the subject was illegal under the Comstock Act. Yet clearly, Americans were practicing some type of birth control. The size of the average family continued to shrink. Some used condoms, uh, which were widely available, um, although they had a kind of salacious quality to them. They were, you know, sort of considered uh, for those who practiced sexuality outside of marriage. Ironically, abortion was more available, though completely illegal. There were all kinds of potions, concoctions, douches, things of that nature that women talked about to other women. But all of this was illegal and hush-hush and underground. In order to change America's attitudes toward contraception, Sanger, a champion of modern sexual thinking, would have to go head-to-head -head with the reigning arbiter of Victorian morality, Anthony Comstock. On November 17, 1912, Sanger launched her first attack by publishing a series of public health articles in the socialist newspaper, The Call. She writes a column called What Every Girl Should Know, which is really daring because if you think there's no legitimate discourse about sexuality for adults, you can be assured that it was considered immoral for young people to be taught about sexuality. Several weeks later, Anthony Comstock made his first move and threatened to revoke the newspaper's mailing permit if her column mentioned gonorrhea and syphilis. In the space where Margaret's column had run, the intemperate editors of the call write a big headline that says, what every girl should know about sex, nothing, Anthony Comstock. 
Undaunted, Sanger launched a new magazine, boldly taunting, no gods, no masters. Then in June 1914, she printed the term birth control for the very first time. Comstock raised the stakes and ordered Sanger arrested. Instead of reporting for trial, she fled to England, leaving her husband and three children behind. While she was in Europe, she visited the first family planning clinic in the world, which was in, in Amsterdam. And she learned in Europe about some better birth control methods than were available in the United States, most notably the diaphragm. Back in the States, Comstock prosecuted Sanger's estranged husband, William, for distributing her obscene pamphlet on family limitation. Birth control became a cause celebre, and Sanger sailed for the States to stand trial. She always tells the story that she literally got off the boat, and the words birth control stared out at her from the headline of the first newspaper she saw. Um, if you could write about it, obviously you could speak about it. On February 8, 1916, a beaming Margaret Sanger exited a New York City courthouse minutes after a judge dismissed the obscenity charges against her. Her nemesis, Anthony Comstock, had passed away seven weeks earlier at the age of 71. Ironically, some say, from a cold caught at William Sanger's trial. Comstock's censorial laws remained on the books, but his own image had fallen from champion of morals to overzealous buffoon. Sanger loved the idea that she and her cause were what ultimately did him in, not that she was unkind about it. It is a kind of curious accident of history. The balance of power had shifted. Now Americans could only watch and wait to see where this new open-minded attitude about sex might lead them. The soldier returning from the European front found the new woman engaged in a struggle of her own. The battle lines had been drawn on October 16, 1916, when Margaret Sanger and her sister opened America's first birth control clinic on Amboy Street in Brooklyn. After circulating flyers that told women in three languages that it was possible to prevent unintended pregnancies, before the doors had even opened the first day, the women were lined up for a block. Women continued to flock to the clinic for nine days until police shut it down. Margaret Sanger served 30 days in prison for violating the Comstock law, but her subsequent appeal resulted in a landmark decision. In 1918, the New York Supreme Court ruled that while Sanger herself could not legally dispense birth control, a physician could. <laughs> 